All right, so welcome back, and uh, we're going to start uh, covering the a laser subject, which is a part of the uh, fifth lecture of the third week, and we're going to measure mention the uh, differences between laser light and everyday light, and the principle of stimulated emission, as well as the principle of population inversion, and these phenomena, um, uh, they are the essential, the fundamental principles of laser light, and they're also presented in the minimals, and it's important to understand them, and uh, as well as cyclops have a firm understanding of uh, stimulated emission and population inversion, in our pursuit to be superheroes, we should uh, follow suit, so let's do that. Let's understand the differences between laser light and everyday light, and when I say everyday light, I really mean spontaneous emission. You should never take up uh, spelling lessons for me. I'm just throwing this uh, as I go. So uh, spontaneous emission, you can think of it as, let's just say, the sun. The sun is spontaneous emission. And when we're talking about spontaneous emission, uh, first of all, we should think about polychromatic light, which means that this is light of all wavelengths, all wavelengths. So the sun spits out all the different wavelengths. Uh, also, you should think about the energy is not focused. You can, you can say low energy density, or you can say um, less energy. I would just write less energy, or energy is not focused. And usually when you say less energy or low energy, the, the idea is that it's not really focused. The energy in these wavelengths are not focused. Uh, we know that UV light can be harmful, but very focused, highly energetic laser light is definitely something we would like to avoid more than the sun. Also, it is uh, a non-polarized light. And when we, when we say polarized, and this is also in the minimals, it's important to understand what polarized is. And there's kind of a floating notion sometimes that it is something, well, it's something else. Basically, what it means is that if I have a bunch of photons, I can align all of them to point in the exact same direction as they propagate meaning that all the respective vectors of these photons are going to point in the same direction. And that's what polarized means. And uh, spontaneous emission, you can think about it, if this is the sun, it's just going in every, every which way. It's not really focused by any means. It's just totally spontaneous in its direction. And also the implication of uh, not being polarized is that you, uh, your incoherent, incoherence in time and space, see, through time and space. So what that really means is that if I shine a spontaneous emission and I measure that emission over a specific distance, it would be dispersed. It would not really be focused either by time. I, I'm measuring it after 20 seconds of, uh, uh, of time, which is a great amount of time for light, or I can say 20 meters, just arbitrary units. Uh, light is going to be dispersed throughout that distance. It's not going to stay coherent or focused. And that's what we really mean when we're saying uh, coherence through time and space. Okay, so these are the four. And when we're talking about laser light, and laser is really the idea behind it as, uh, as stimulated, stimulated emission. Simulated emission, and you can just take all the uh, characteristics that you're seeing on this side and just flip them over. And instead of saying polychromatic, what we're looking for is monochromatic. Monochromatic means a uh, specific wavelength. Specific wavelength. Perfect. Also, when we're talking about energies, it's highly focused. It's energetic. Energy is focused very well, and that's what we mean. Uh, also, you should think, uh, obviously, non-polarized. We just emit the non, and we get polarized light. So this is going to be polarized. Again, which means that all the uh, photons, all their vectors, are pointing in the exact same direction. This is polarized. And because it's polarized, we're also going to see coherence. Coherence through time and space. And that means that if I take a range of, let's say, 1,000 meters, my uh, energetic, focused, monochromatic, polarized light is going to stay coherent and focused throughout a great distance. And this is really what I mean about coherence in time and space. 
Perfect. And now when we have a firm understanding of the differences between a spontaneous emission and laser stimulated emission, there really shouldn't be parentheses here. I didn't know why I put it here. Let's keep on going and uh, touch base with the first principle, stimulated emission. And when we're talking about simulated emission, obviously a key phrase is stimulated. We are creating or we are nudging that emission. Let's just say I have these two energy levels. And uh, we know that at random, molecules can be uh, excited either by light, uh, let's say uh, electricity, electricity, or kinetic energy, some kinetic motion. And that excitation could cause an electron to get excited and jump up. Now it's here. Now that electron that is here can spontaneously relax, spontaneously, and emit a photon. That happened at random. This is spontaneous. Which means we really can't control this process here. Because as soon as, uh, as this molecule is excited, uh, an electron jumps up, and at random, spontaneously, it would drop down and potentially emit a photon. But what may also happen is that I can have a situation in which I have an electron that is excited already. I have a molecule with an excited electron. And this electron has the potential to drop down and emit a photon. And what I do is I am going to stimulate that electron to drop down and emit that photon. I'm just going to stimulate it by using another photon. That photon is going to come through, interact with this electron. You can think of it as bounce off of it or nudge it. And that electron um, responding to that uh, interaction is just going to drop down and emit a photon. And this is, uh, this is stimulated. This is what we mean by stimulated emission. Stimulated. Now, ideally, and this is, uh, this is just a preparation for the next principle, ideally, what we need to have in, uh, in laser light is a bunch of, the, of these excited electrons, a bunch of these excited electrons, all excited. They're all excited. They all have the potential energy to drop down and emit that photon. And they're all excited, and they're just waiting for me to give them that nudge. And when I give them that nudge, they are going to drop down and emit that photon. What's also important to, under, to understand, and I, uh, I, I kind of neglected to mention that, is that this photon, this photon right here, after nudging, this electron just keeps on going. It's not absorbed anywhere because this electron already has energy. Energy was already absorbed. So this photon, this photon that I use to excite this, uh, this electron here, is just going to keep on going on its way. So ideally, we would have this situation in which all I need to do is just go boom, and then I have all these guys drop down, and all these guys will emit photons. This is ideally what we want to have. So uh, being that we know a little bit about what we need for laser light, we're going to talk a little bit about population inversion. Let's do that. And in population inversion, what I really mean is that I have, let's just say I have a population of molecules. And I know some of them can be excited, some of them can be in the ground state. But in, uh, in everyday life, or rather in, in any given situation, most of my molecules, providing that I didn't, I didn't provide them with energy at all, most of them are going to be in the ground state. Only some of them, these bold ones, a few of them, a very small fraction is going to be excited. Again, this happens at random. This can, this can happen due to kinetic energy that comes through its way, uh, some, uh, some uh, energetic transitions here, and this happens at random entirely. And we also mentioned what I want ideally to have is as many of these guys excited as I can before I start the lasing process. And what I can do is at this point, I can introduce a lot of energy to the system, and this is called pumping pumping, and I can use an electrical charge to, uh, to pump, I can use photons to pump, I can use various mechanisms, but I introduce energy to this system, and I create a situation, and this is after pumping, I create a situation where most of my molecules, most of them are going to be excited, most of them are going to be in my excited state, and these are the molecules 
that I'm iterating right now that are, that are bold, that are all full. And only some are going to be in my ground state potentially. So this is basically an inversion of the population. And that's very important to understand because at this point, I have a higher potential to, uh, to produce uh, strong vivid laser light because I have a lot of these guys here that have energy that I can use all at the same time. And it's really important to use my laser light all at the same time to make sure it's focused. All the energy needs to come out at the same time. So how do I achieve population inversion? And this is quite interesting. And also quite, quite important to understand. We also, we uh, mentioned before that if we have two energy levels, we can have a situation where an electron in this molecule is excited, it jumps up, it's over here, then at random it'll just drop down and emit a photon potentially. And this is spontaneous. I cannot control this process. But what happens, what happens if I were to add another energy level here? What, what would happen if I were to add another energy level? Let's consider that. Let's consider three energy levels now. I have one energy level, a higher energy level, and an intermediate energy level. Let's just say I have this electron. It absorbs some sort of, uh, let's just say electrical. I just say it's electrical pumping. I pumped it. Now, it gained the energy and it went up. And instead of spontaneously, it's over here, instead of spontaneously going down back, it has an intermediate level that it can spontaneously drop down to and stay in. And if you see, this level still has some potential energy here, which means that this, this energy can still be used. Essentially, what I would have if I do this whole uh, pumping process to a bunch of molecules, to a population of molecules that have at least three of these energy stages, I would end up with such a situation where I would have molecules that just have these electrons in the intermediate level just waiting for me to give them that nudge, just waiting for me to give them that photon so they could drop down and emit their own photon. And again, this photon is just going to keep on going. So this is population inversion. By pumping the system, and again, just the essentials of population inversion, just the essentials here, first of all, I have a situation where most molecules are in my ground state. Most are in the ground state. Then what I do is I pump, pump the system. This is called pumping. And at this point, I achieve a situation where most are in the excited, excited state. And going from this state to this state is called population inversion. This is population inversion, as depicted here. This and then this. These are the two stages. And what's important to understand, because we already went through this, in order to have population inversion, I need to at least have, and this is important, at least three energy levels. Three energy levels. And ideally, ideally, this is a D, ideally I would have four. But three energy levels is enough to uh, get these electrons waiting at an excited state, in a state that I can actually uh, control the emission to stimulate that emission at a given time that I want. And again, the idea with having three levels is just by having that intermediate level here, I can have a level that would get the electron, instead of dropping down, let's just say it gets excited, instead of dropping down randomly to the lower level, it has another lower level, intermediate, that it can just hang out at and just wait for me to give it that nudge. And again, the whole idea of population inversion is that I have a bunch of molecules, most of the molecules, a bunch of molecules that are just waiting for a nudge. And if you uh, notice here, I mentioned that if I, if I have one photon here, if I have this one photon that I used to nudge this guy, this guy dropped down here and emitted this photon, this photon right here is going to keep on going. So essentially, by putting one photon through to an excited molecule, I'm getting two out. 
And if this interacts with another molecule that drops down and emits a photon here, and this photon will keep on going. So you can imagine that this would exponentially double. And you can imagine that if I have, let's say, I'm just going to throw a number, a million molecules here that are excited, this is going to create a massive, a massive chain reaction that will go either uh, all in all directions and in a very small fraction of time is going to have, we're going to have a lot of photons running around here. And that's important to understand when we're going to talk about the mechanism of how laser is generated. So this was, uh, this was the stimulated emission and the population inversion. They're in the minimals. You know what? Why, why don't we take a look? Oh, there we go. What are the basic phenomena a laser is based on? Population inversion and stimulated emission. And I do believe that the, uh, different, uh, the, different, uh, the, the differences here may also be in the minimals represented at some, uh, in some uh, form of, um, of uh, depicting the different uh, or listing the different characteristics of a laser light. So this is pretty much it. Hopefully you found this, uh, you found this helpful. And in the next video we'll go through what is the mechanism uh, that we're using stimulated emission and population inversion to actually give us, to effectively give us a laser light. See you in the next video.